with one of the guys I fished with. I told him, I said, I'm going to wallpaper my room. I got a fishing room at the house. I said, I'm going to wallpaper that this room with them citations. And next thing I had 20, then 30, and then 50. And I was like, I, don't, I could I could go for 100. And talking to Kevin Enzer at the DNR, he's like, I don't know that anybody has ever officially done that. And to his knowledge, he's the one that issues the citations. Nobody's ever reached that milestone of 100 citation largemouth. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia, and Shallow Water Fishing Adventures Baits, online, located in Mount Airy, Maryland. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Fishing DMV. I'm your host, Thomas Aarons, and today we're heading back to Western Maryland, the farthest west you could possibly go, really, until you get into that weird, wonderful world that they call West Virginia. And I'm here with Jason, who was on the show about two years ago. And the, the thumbnail title that they, that episode really shot off was, you know, how to catch 2,000 fish in a year. And he had a really, really interesting goal that you had, a passionate goal to achieve could, could you let people know that they haven't watched that episode? It was a good episode, by the way. If you're listening, you should go watch it again. What that goal was? Uh, the goal was to uh, catch 4,000 bass in a three-year period. And I ended up with 4,020 out of my boat wow. in a three-year three -year period, logging all of those bass. So, you guys, I, I, I did him injustice because it was actually 4,000, which is – Yeah. I can't even – that was my head around that's so many fish that's in so three years fish. three years yeah in the one year period i had 1642 the most in one year that i've ever recorded myself mm. dude that's insane what have you been up to since then since then a lot i've helped high school coach high school team uh we just sent uh the maryland team to nationals out of my boat that was quite a that's awesome Beat accomplishment, a little bit of maybe the good Lord and divine intervention there, maybe. And I met this young man at the dock and come to find out their boat, like the week before the state tournament broke down, he wasn't going to get to fish the state tournament. One thing led to another. Um, I ended up helping them. They ended up using my boat um, and winning the state tournament with their dad as their captain. So they That's so cool. Were, just went to Tennessee last year to represent our state at the nationals for high school. So that was, that was really fun. So they went from, they had never won a high school tournament to that point. Um, I worked with them in a couple of weeks prior, teaching them some techniques, tips, and they ended up winning the state tournament. So um, fishing techniques that I, that I taught them on Deep Creek. So I was pretty happy with that. So how long were you doing that for? Doing what for? Uh, Teaching high school or, or being a part of high school fishing? I have done it for five, six, seven years now, and I've got a couple young kids. Hopefully in the next couple of weeks, I'll get to start helping them. That They're in the youth division. They're not even in high school yet. So maybe I'll get to help those couple mm. young, young boys and um, help speed up their skills and knowledge, especially in Western Maryland on Deep Creek. Yeah, because like, I mean, that's the thing is like when you're at that young age, any kind of help you can get just to get into, you know, the fast track of learning what to do just to be semi successful, not to be the best ever, but just to have success to that you want to continue to do the sport. Yeah. Um, and then and before we get going a little bit more, if you could move your head over a little bit to your right that way. Yeah, dead center. Perfect. Yeah, that's and what I'm working at. Yep. Perfect. And the power of editing that will be gone. Point two six. Perfect. That's what I love about pretty recording. You go to that, you're you're apparently one of the best fishing high school coaches in Western Maryland because you took a team to States. And you have some other things going on that you were trying to achieve, correct? Yeah, that's actually the third team I've sent to Nationals out of, out of my old 96 Ranger. Really? Yeah, Maryland gets to send two teams each year. Huh. And I've sent three of them to Nationals. So I'm pretty, pretty happy with that with the old boat, so goes to show, you know, maybe it ain't all, you know, $100,000 boats and live scope and everything. Sometimes just good old hard work can do it. Is Deep Creek generally where you have tournaments for that stuff? Or are there <laughs> other lakes that you can have little high school derbies? 
Oh, yes. They have them all over the state. And then they rotate the state championship um, that qualifies you for nationals. Usually it's a Deep Creek one year, then maybe on to Potomac the next year. They try to move it back and forth for the boys. But we have on Deep Creek, the yacht, they have high school tournaments in our area, like the Deep Creek Yacht Reservoir, Jennings Reservoir. Um, those three, they've had them on. So. Is Yakagani and Jennings a lot alike when it comes to the style that you're teaching the kids? Yeah, they're quite different than Deep Creek. Deep Creek, you know, is shallower, weedy, grassy, dock skipping. Those two are what we call a highland reservoir, a lot of steep, rocky banks, smallmouth come into play. Um, different techniques versus skipping docks. You're maybe drop shotting, let's say, on there, or you know, versus cover your fishing more structure and stuff. That is interesting because when you bring up like dock skipping, it, it, dock skipping is really dependent, I think, on the type of docks that you're skipping. So, example is tidal. The docks, if the tide is low, you have like seven feet that you can be able to throw it under there. Uh, you go to Smith Mountain Lake, you have docks that are actually posted into the ground so you have the bars and stuff Kerr, it's all floating docks and then at deep creek at least when i've been there a lot of the docks man you don't have a lot of area or gap to get yeah. those baits into like you got to be good at it yeah it's it's quite an art and i take a lot of people and and, and show them what i do but it takes a lot of practice and dedication and then usually a little bit into it they're like holy crap you know, and um, just to have the nerve to pull up behind a very expensive pontoon and put a jig or a bait up that little tiny mm -hmm. hole you have between the motor and the pontoon and not hit either one and things like that. It, it's a where much more than a what at Deep Creek for me, anyhow, um, is putting it under those docks and pontoons and stuff. And it, it's a like no other there's no other lake i've ever went to that's completely surrounded with docks and there's fish out there. you can go anywhere in that lake and catch fish per, for the most part under docks how has the grass been at deep creek this year really good yeah um i haven't seen a lot of it even though the lake is for the for deep creek it's low with the amount of rain we have not had um there's people having to move push docks out and stuff so um, it's, it's down quite a bit from the normal pool level on there. So you'd think the grass would be up and topped out more, but it, it, it hasn't. So, mm. um, there's some of the back of the pockets and stuff last week, when it, last weekend when I was there, that's, it's topped out. And, um, but I thought it would be a lot thicker with, cause generally the lake is never this low at this time of year with, and as hot as it's been for up home, anyhow, up in Garrett County. I would have thought this year would have been really thick grass and weeds, but it hasn't been too bad. Is that all due to just the drought or are they pulling more water than they usually would? It's uh, to the drought. Yes. As far as I know, they're not, they're pulling the least amount of water that they can the way I understand, unless I have that incorrect on there. And I know the yacht, which is downstream of there of, of deep Creek is very, very low. This wow. year's been crazy, dude. It really has. Because I know, like, parts of the Shenandoah Valley, like, you're not allowed to fish for trout anymore. It's, like, banned yeah. because of uh, how bad the weather has been recently. Yeah. Um, that, that came into effect down here, too, on the eastern shore with Bethel, where the fish kill was. That The water got so hot, there's algae bloom, oxygen dropped. And you can see on the reed lines where it's down. The water's way down. And it affected and strained the fish. And, I wonder if it does that at Deep Creek and stuff. It hasn't killed them or anything, but it definitely maybe pushes them out more or whatever, and the thermocline comes into play. Yeah, exactly. Because like if it gets stale, like like at Lake Ann or places like that where you don't have enough flow or current or turbidity, it'll create issues. And I think we really need to set the stage for that too because you talk about the Eastern Shore and people are like, wait a minute, he's in Western Maryland at Deep Creek? What does that mean? So you, you work – or you were working in the Eastern shore. So you got to experience that type of fishing as well. Yes. That's where I'm at now. I've been here since, since February through the week, I'm down here. And that's wow. one of the things I love about our sport. I knew nothing, nobody. When I come down here in February, I got on Google earth, started finding ponds that started driving around before, you know, 
the snow even come off, just finding places I could go when it warmed up. And that led into, we stopped, hit a couple from the bank and caught a, caught a bass. And I'm like, man, there's bass in here. And then one thing leads to another. I met guys on the shore when it started warming up, you know, maybe in the March, first of April down here. And it's just the community that we're in. And it's just like you and I talking the next thing. I'm like, Hey bud, what's your name? What's your next thing? We're on Facebook together. And now I got three or four buddies down here that we go fishing with in the evenings. And it, I, I love it. It's just a brotherhood. And they, they're like, man, did you ever try this place? You ever try it? And, and the fun fishing down here is, is incredible. Um, but like you said, it, it is title and that's, that's a whole new, some of the places we go to is, is tidal, like Bethel was a tidal, but there's a couple places like the Bohemia River. I've never really got to experience that, that you go and where you caught bass, you know, four hours from now is mud. You know, it, it's crazy. I love it. Uh, snakeheads come into play. We've got to catch those. And Did but, you take your boat with you? No, we actually, when we got down here, we ended up purchasing a couple kayaks. Oh, cool. Yep. So, yep, we uh been just kayak fishing small little places, you know, that are accessible to them. So, yep, that's what I'm saying. That's, I love, that's one thing I love about bass fishing is <laughs> I'm down here in a $149 tractor supply kayak. And, you know, tomorrow I'll be on Deep Creek in a bass boat. Mm. but but it's it's the pureness of the sport and i just i guess since i was a kid just like chasing them big old bats well i and that kind of gets into the other aspect of this too which is the citations and i, I guess we need to set the stage for this so you had a big goal that you're getting submitted to the maryland department yes um like I said, a couple years ago, I set the goal of the 4,000 bass in three years. I did that, which led into a little rousing on Facebook of, well, anybody can catch a bunch of little ones. And I caught a lot of big ones. So I started a side, turning them in for citation. And I jokingly, with one of the guys I fished with, I told him, I said, I'm going to wallpaper my room. I got a fishing room at the house. I said, I'm going to wallpaper that this room with them citations. And next thing I had 20, then 30, and then 50. And I was like, I, don't, I could I could go for 100. And talking to Kevin Enzer at the DNR, he's like, I don't know that anybody has ever officially done that. And to his knowledge, he's the one that issues the citations. Nobody's ever reached that milestone of 100 citation largemouth, which is a 21-inch largemouth, which averages about a five-pound largemouth on there. Um, and... I had them anywhere from four, one that was 4.3 pounds and real skinny. And the biggest one was eight, four. And that was out of that eight at Bethel pond. But, uh, yeah. So I just, just stretched that milestone of my 100 citation for large mouth. So, and I did that in a little over about two years span. What did you, did you change the way you fished? Like, was this a specific goal that you had in mind? Yeah. Um, in all honesty, yes. Uh, where I fished, how I fished, from going from numbers to to big ones, yeah. Um, generally, I, I changed my techniques and approach on there, going to bigger baits, bigger lines. Um, like you said, like the Yakagani Savage Reservoir, which is a job boat only reservoir in Western Maryland, it's loaded. It's a, it's a numbers lake. Now, there's some big ones in there, but it's not uncommon to have a 50 fish day down there. Mm. But, um, but from that going to a lot of those, I'm going to say 70% plus were out of deep Creek of, of the 100. But uh, yeah, a lot of days, a lot of them in the spring, um, pre-spawn crank baiting. Um, that's something I didn't do a whole, whole lot. I might, get six or eight bites a day, but four of them is probably citation size. That's insane. Big wow. female. <clears throat> but yeah, to answer your question, my techniques of how I fish, mm. where I fish changed to target bigger fish, which it did affect, you know, my numbers, my numbers go down. 
That's such an, I just, I love this idea of this goal because I think so many times we're just tournament fishing versus doing these, these, these state programs that we have to become a master angler of catching different multi-species and, and the trophy size in those specific, uh, fish categories, whether it's a pike or a, a, a crappie, a brook trout or bass. And then your goal here of like catching a hundred citation, that's absolutely, it, it's a remarkable feat, dude. It really is. Yeah. It, I'm pretty proud of it. So, um, everybody asks now, like, what's next? <laughs> um, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know where to go from here. I like helping the kids. Um, as I mentioned with you, I, I'm, I'm excited to maybe get on the Black Bass Advisory Committee. I would love to do that and be involved in that. Um, but those were my goals recently. So over 4,000 fish in three years, 4,000 bass caught in three years mm -hmm. and a hundred state citations in Maryland is absolutely amazing. What makes deep Creek so special when you say 70% of those citations come out of deep Creek? I think most people just think that's where you go, you know, to have a vacation, to party, to have a wedding. I don't think a lot of people know outside the maybe the, the niche fishing community that Deep Creek's a, not a bad place to fish. Deep Creek's phenomenal fishing, but it comes at a cost like this time of year. By 10 o'clock in the morning, that place is a madhouse with boat traffic. So you just have to go knowing that that's what it's going to be and, uh, and work around it. There's a lot of places that are no wake zones, such as Pond Run, State Park, Polar Run. You you can get away from it a little bit. They they might not be the best places, but you can get away from the traffic a little bit. But then by 10, 11 o'clock, it seems like about every other third docks, there's somebody swimming on it or tubing. And you got to burn a lot of gas and move a lot. But the key, the key to it is – I mean, we're there before the sun's up, and usually by 11, 12 o'clock, we're off the water. And then you can get a little bit in the evening from 6 o'clock till dark. I guess they go in for dinner or whatever they're doing for the evening, and it calms down a lot. But that midday period is is Brutal. tough. Yeah, but the fish, fish are – it is fishing great. Um Tournament weights, it seems like 16 plus pounds to win a tournament. The bags are very consistent. It's not uncommon to hear one 18 to the 20 pound bag. One and that's in the summertime, correct? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So, yeah, and it's very, very consistent. And then if you go, like if you follow any of the tournaments or weigh ins, a lot of places you go is like a real heavy top, what they call a top heavy tournament where yeah. you got three or four guys that really caught them. But Deep Creek, you go, and I mean, it seems like if there's 20 boats, there'll be 12 or 15 of them guys with a good bag. I mean, it's, a lot of times it's just ounces that win the tournament, and everybody's right there together. It, it fishes really good. It it reminds me a lot, the times that I was there, it reminds me a lot of like Lake Champlain, the way the docks are where you, you can roll the docks out of the So if you guys don't know, in lakes that freeze over and have a good ice fishing scene, honestly, like up north of Minnesota and Lake Champlain, a lot of the docks there are meant so you can roll them out of the water so they don't get stuck in the ice. And so that's kind of the vibe there with the docks. You have the SAV of a lot of uh, grass there in that lake, which I think makes the perch fishing and 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 the bass fishing that much better. And you have the biodiversity that you can catch largemouth and smallmouth, which is really interesting for that place. Yes, it is loaded with smallmouth. And then that's, they, like you said, diversity, a lot of times they don't want to intermingle. I mean, you can catch a fish anywhere, but it seems like you get in the back thirds of pockets or coves where it's shallow and grassy, it's more largemouth. And you pull out more on the front rocky points, you can almost call your shot and it'll change and go to smallmouth on there that's where i used to skip like a finesse jig or a trd um ned rig drop shot finesse fishing and there wasn't hardly a day i couldn't catch 20 plus smallmouth easily up there mm. but they're pound pound and a half smallmouth you know that's not going to make citation so like you were saying it changed my fishing a lot to where i had to put that away and 
and go to the bigger stuff and and i i mean i'll burn right past those places and go to where my trolling motor is in the dirt what's yeah. the grass um is there a grass fishing bite right now and and i guess i'll set the scene when you think the tidal potomac river and, and you already said this earlier, but we'll just do it again for people that are listening. The tidal Potomac River this time of year, you're talking matted vegetation, hydrilogous mats where you're frog fishing and all that. Is it that type of grass fishing or is it submerged? You get on the grass edge and, and you throw around there type. It has both. It has a really good frog bite and there's a, kind of a group of guys that are known. <laughs> you, know, you, can know, you know, this guy, this guy, this guy, they are frog guys. Um, and there's a lot of topped out matted vegetation for that. And then I see other guys now with the technology we have out, it it's changed just like everywhere else. I hate to go there, but the, the forward facing sonar, you see guys out on grass edge, grass weed lines on there. Um, not really my cup of tea. I have it on my boat, but I am, I am in the elementary <laughs> level <laughs> using it. Um, it's the most expensive depth finder I've ever bought. I'll put it that way. <laughs> it is it, it's a very interesting technology. Yes. Uh, how has the walleye and the pike fishing affected the largemouth fishing? I don't know how it's affected it, but the walleye and pike fishing is phenomenal. Now, nice. Deep Creek this year also changed to a slot limit on the walleye on there. I think it's between 18 and 21 inches. You can't keep... Uh, I'm not a walleye guy, so I'm not up on that real well. But there is a slot limit on Deep Creek now to help boost that, make it a better trophy walleye managed lake. From what I've heard, pike fishing is incredible, like we've talked before. Um, I catch a lot of them bass fishing, especially in the spring on jerk baits. But it's not uncommon. 10, 12, 14 pound pikes, it, they're daily, 10 pounders almost daily it seems like it there's a lot of them i remember two years ago i think before i interviewed you i went up with uh, with the uh the dnr guy that runs that place and i caught i think it was almost a 40 incher on a big old uh, musky bait and they're pretty as hell like i know guys that there's there's issues with them and stuff and that but i will still say like that's setting the hook into one of those big ones is like setting it into a piece of concrete like they have such freaking hard mouths dude it's insane the hooks that you need to stick that hook home yeah you know and then <clears throat> i sacrifice a lot of baits too <laughs> that's what amazes me you'll be with a jerk bait and it just zip 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 gone and, mm. um but yeah and then uh the, the teeth in them and stuff. I mean, they're an alpha predator. It, it's, they're amazing. And I just, I've seen some of them in there. You think you wouldn't let your kids swim in there. <laughs> they are huge. What, but, um, this time of year is interesting. Cause and I, I want to set this with, with the geographical location for people that don't know deep Creek. It's really interesting being in Western Maryland where it's located how high it is elevation wise and the temperatures and the seasons there right now generally speaking just to set this how how hot is it there like right now in july in deep creek um i know the other day i was down here and it was in the 90s and i called my son at 75. you and know then, back home. i don't know now i mean i have 86 here right now just to be curious i can look it up and yeah like give or take but but then in november the lake could be frozen over yes yeah like that's o insane october november is crazy for the fact that you don't know what you're going to get in october the fall fishing is phenomenal especially for smallmouth there um small spinner baits moving baits uh kytex anything that looks like a shad small is going to get eat there it's phenomenal but it's a roll of the dice it, it, you could have two foot of snow it could be 75 degrees um mm. so uh yeah it's what 81 at the house right now and it's 86 so, down here so it's not a big yeah. difference today and, it, and it's funny because like there are massive tournaments at lake anna like at thanksgiving weekend and it's 60 degrees but you go to deep creek which is it doesn't feel like it's that far away but the weather there is so much different i remember a couple of years ago the antietam bass masters was going to have a tournament at deep creek in the spring and it was like may and it was still snowing it was like two or three yeah. years ago it's 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 crazy that elevation but i think that actually helps the fishing because 
like you mentioned earlier, fall fishing in a lot of places is terrible, but at Deep Creek, it's one of those those places that gives us that northern vibe of they have to eat because the lake will be frozen soon. Yes. And then after the holidays between Memorial and Labor Day, it it's a different lake. There is nobody there. It is beautiful. The fall foliage and, and the fishing is is phenomenal. I mean, like I said, I, I like a lot of moving baits and I'll go back to jerk baits in the fall too. But, but they definitely put the feed sacks on, like you're saying before, it locks up for ice out or ice in the winter. And then there's very little pressure that time of year, no boats out. It, it's, that's what we jokingly say we get our lake back. But, uh, but it, it, yeah, anybody that hasn't tried it, um, Garrett County, Oakland area, you're not going to meet nicer, better people. Um, it's a great place to bring a family, the wife and kids and, and enjoy what we got up there but uh when you when you tongue in cheek uh say we get our lake back it reminds me of like lake anna in the springtime <laughs> or the summertime and lake anna gets super packed for people that don't know lake anna is roughly seven to nine thousand acres uh for the public side deep creek if i'm not mistaken off the top of my head is like five to six it's 3,900 acres. 39. Jesus. Yeah. So yep. when you're talking boat pressure, it probably gets packed. Yes. It, it's, yeah, to the point that you keep hearing somebody needs to do something. There's accidents constantly with jet skis, pontoons, wake boats. Um, a lot of people are concerned about the erosion control on the shorelines with the wake boats. Um, but for the most part, I have very little problem. And I'm not going to sit here and be a hypocrite because it brings in a lot of tourist money to our area, a lot of commerce. And most everybody I meet on that lake, I, I've had a few people come down and yell at me for fishing their docks. But it's amazing the people come down are just curious. You know, what are you catching? How do you do that? Or what's that fish? And, you know, um, so I, I, we're very blessed to have what we have in our county. And like I said, 99.9% .9 of the people are the nicest people you ever met on that lake. And I've got some really good friends that I've met that have moved here or are new to the area. And I like the compliments we get, you know, like, man, we really like it here. And, but yeah, if anybody hasn't ever, tried it out or has any questions or whatever, they can look me up on Facebook or, I mean, we can tell them good places to eat, bad places don't go there, <laughs> where to stay. Um, and I'll help them all I can, you know, if they got questions about fishing on there, just shoot me a message on Facebook and I'd love to help them. When, when you mentioned techniques this time of year, you mentioned crankbaits in the spring. When, have you gotten into the glide bait scene at all? Not so much. I have a good friend of mine that's big into it, and he has produced some really nice fish on there. But I personally haven't got into the glide baits that much. Um, one of the reasons to reiterate, like we said, most of your glide baits on there, you're spending 40 to 60 bucks on a lot of them to be a good glide bait, in my opinion, like a bull shot, anything like that. And most of the time you throw it and you'll catch a bass, catch a bass, catch a bass. And the next thing a pike has a souvenir. And then I got, <laughs> I got an upset wife wanting to know where that $60 bait, you know, why I need another one all of a sudden. So, um, yeah, so you have to play to that a little bit. I would rather lose a $3 jig than, a, than an expensive swim bait. So sadly that, there's another factor of Deep Creek. You know, you might have boat pressure pushes you to places you don't really want to go, but you can get in there to fish and not get knocked out of your boat. And then you have, you know, pickerel and pike that they'll eat every other lure you throw in there. So, but no, I have not thrown guide baits as much. Um, Austin Graham, a boy I fish with, loves them. And he has caught some true giants. Um, he caught one this year. It was probably in the six pound range up there, which is a really good fish for up there. Anything you get, five six pounds it's a big fish for in there i know some people in the comment section of this or people listening on apple or spotify are gonna be like oh okay 18 pounds whatever 15 okay that's not bad but come on but that's in the summertime what are the weights in the spring in the fall generally speaking for a tournament if there was one 
Well, we can't have up there because they can't keep them till after June 18th in Maryland. Um, mm. So that comes into effect. They can't bring them in to weigh them in. That's when the tournament season starts for them is June 8th, usually around June 18th, give or take whatever day the state picks, I guess, in that ballpark. But it's usually in the middle of June on there. Now in the fall, I mean, do you get a bag over 20 pounds? That's that's a good bag, but it stays pretty consistent in that 16, 20-pound bag. And, you know, I've seen days where 12 and 13 pounds is one at two. It's fishing. So some days is better than others, but seems very consistent in that 16 to 20 pound range. Do you think that like could produce a seven to 10 pounder? Yes. I know for a fact it can. I got a seven five this year. Oh, well, there you go. <laughs> yeah. 10 pounder. <laughs> I, you always hear rumors, you know, and seven and a few eights um, is the biggest. I can honestly say that I truly believe seen, I've seen credibly come out of there in recent, you know, in the last five, six yeah. seven years. Um, that I've seen pictures and guys I know aren't full of mud, <laughs> you know, that, that they're true weights. Um, I know a couple, I know the one, uh, Larry Beckman, I believe it was his dad. He had a seven twelve, I think in a tournament last year, you know, wow. weight. So, um, but yeah, seven pounder is pretty rare. You know, what about the smallmouth size? Like what's the biggest smallmouth you've seen come out of there? Smallmouth, if you get anything in the four pound category, that's a really good one. Like I said, they, they it's not like Erie and other places like that. The Yawk and Ganey's got some really big smallmouth in it, Yawk Reservoir, but Deep Creek, most of them are a pound and a half, two pounds. Um, you get something in that three or four pound category, that's a that's a that's a good one for there. But it is full of of small, smallmouth, the pound, pound and a half ones. Hmm. I wonder why that is. Yeah. That's I I don't know that I've honestly seen or witnessed anything much over four four pounds out there. Why do you think the Yakagani's got such big smallmouth in it? I that I don't know, and I've wondered that versus Deep Creek myself on there. But um, my personal best for in our area was four pounds eleven ounces, and it came out of the Yak. Hmm. There. But I've heard of of them over five and stuff in there. But um, the Yak doesn't fish numbers wise as good as deep creek from what i everybody tells me but it has better quality especially smallmouth bass in there do you think the yawk or deep creek is harder to figure out uh, the yawk definitely yeah at least for me anyhow but they both fish really good um and they're total total opposites i mean yakagini reservoir very few docks it's all steep rock cliff bank thing at the yacht it gets me is everything looks good it just mm -hmm. doesn't look like anywhere you, you just throw a lure anywhere and one would be there so when you were teaching your kids which did they prefer to fish the style that's at yakagani or the style at deep creek deep creek kids love skipping docks yep yeah you, you skip up under and then deep creek we do top water a lot first thing in the morning and that works really well for kids especially in tournaments for me i can pull them out on open water on a grass flat and the kids get really nervous in the tournament every tournament's the bassmaster classic to them so the nerves are always really high mm -hmm. so one of the tricks as a captain when i was coaching them is i'd pull them out on open i wouldn't go to my best places first like skipping docks right out of the gate I'll pull in somewhere it's open water, a big grass flat, put a whopper popper on, a Zara spoon. That's smart. That's really smart. Then they're not hung up. Um, and it just, I just, I don't know if it's lucky or repeatable, but usually we would get a good one, you know, get a few blow ups, get a few fish in the boat, get the nerves out, and then we go skipping docks. And the top water bite's really good. I love a Zara spook. And I don't know that they make a bad collar. I mean, I stay pretty basic, like the bones, the baby bass. I like the feather treble, the Zara Spook Juniors with the double hook. And I've caught them on every collar I think they make of them. But I'll throw that till that fog burns off the water in the mornings, and then I'll go to docks. And it seems like the higher that sun gets up, it pushes them up under the docks, and then the boat traffic starts, and they go under the docks. But what amazes me is you can – 
skip in or cast in and hit right in the front of a dock and that thing will sink nothing you can do it two three times in a row and then skip up under there which is two three foot further back up under there and it'll hit it, it it's crazy they will not come out from underneath that cover to, to hit a lure it seems like a lot of times but definitely the kids love that they love skipping docks i mean it's yeah there's they always make comments there's nothing funner than skipping under a dock and you're and, and I, I, a street fight getting them out of there it's, so i've had this conversation with with numerous friends that have given that have given me uh giving me crap for it because i use inshore spinning tackle a lot of times for my skipping needs because if you can catch a redfish or a speck trout you can catch that and in a tournament if i i can't blow up a spinning reel skipping yep but i have friends that will spend six thousand dollars on a japanese magnetic reel with a blue chip so yeah. it will never it, it, it'll never snag what is your skipping setup that you you enjoy i skip with a bait caster if i'm skipping a jig but you it's very inefficient versus a spinning rod my favorite setup, I hate to let the cat out of the bag, is I like a Dobbin 703 spinning rod, a Revo rocket reel because it's the fastest spinning reel made. Mm. Um, I love that because you're up under that dock and then you fish it two, three foot and you're out. I, it's fast, super fast. It's crazy. If I go back to like, it, it's a seven, six to one, I think it is. If I go to like, which most reels are like, spinning reels are like a five, two. Yeah. I, I feel like I'm in like slow motion. I, it kills me. I've got so used to those Revo rockets that that thing is a tool that changed my game. Because um, even if the boat's moving and I'm drifting past the dock, a lot of times I'm like, I can get in there and have it back before I, I need to be at this, before I need to get under here. I can make that cast and have it back before I drift past there. And I don't have to hit the motor and spook them on there. So that that's a big secret to that. Um, let's get Senkos a lot. A Senko is one of the easiest baits there is to skip. A wacky rig Senko is impossible to beat on Deep Creek, in my opinion. Really? Um, it's the easiest bait to skip. You're not going to cry if a pike eats it. Um, and you can put it under a pontoon. Um, I love a jig. I think I get more bites on a jig, but I don't get away in a with what I do with the Senko, you can skip under a pontoon. You get a, maybe a slight doll thong off the side of it. If you happen to hit the pontoon part where a jig, you get the down. And if you get that, we call it the kiss of death. Most of the time, you're not going to get bit if you do that. Um, but yeah, to answer your question, I like a spinning rod. Um, and that's hard for a lot of guys. Like you're saying, a lot of guys don't like to put that bait caster down. It's, it's, mm -hmm. And, and go to a spinning rod but yeah i use a spinning rod i use suffix 832 they're 15 20 pound braid and a 15 pound cigar fluorocarbon leader and then my thing now is finding a hook i like i have tried every hook out there as far as for a wacky rig um i like a right now i've been using the gamagatsu straight shank um round bend worm hook and that and then like a two watt i use a big hook in the vmc crossover band um, that that's usually my setup 90% of the time. Anybody knows me, I'm, I'm, I'm skipping, skipping docks with either a jig or a Senko. And Explain, um, the bait casting setup. When, when you do use a jig, are, are you, what type of bait casting really are you using? Um, most of the time I use a dollar to Tula on there. And then okay. like you were, I was laughing cause you said about the chip. I bought into that too with like the Shimano <laughs> PCs and yeah. I, I'll take a Tatula any day of the week um, on there. Yeah, if you had, to, if you give me $200 to spend on a reel and said, this is doing when you get out by a, a, a Daiwa Tatula. Yeah. That's, That's fighting words for a lot of people, man. I know that, yeah, that Shimano Daiwa rivalry is, is hardcore. Yeah. And I don't want to be a hypocrite because that's what I got down here with me is the Shimanos and the, I love them. Um, but yeah, the Shimano's, Daiwa's, lose they're all good. And they are, it's its the Ford Chevy Dodge thing. You know, every, all yeah. of them have their following, but you can't, you can argue it however you want. Um, most of the time, it's what I go in and they're like on sale or I get a deal or grandma bought me it for Christmas and it's what she picked. <laughs> you know, so I'm happy with whatever I got. 
I'm not real picky, but yeah, if, if anybody new to the game or whatever, that's a mistake I see a lot is they're like, I'm going to get a bait caster and try it. And they go to Walmart and buy a $39 Shakespeare bait caster and, Somebody that's really good with a bait caster might be able to use that. But if you're learning, that's not the way to go. You need to invest into in the $200 range, in my opinion, whichever one you pick. I don't think you could go wrong other than a mistake I see a lot with these kids and stuff. And a lot of moms and dads don't have that money to spend, which is fine and stuff. But, um, yeah, I see a lot of guys with the, the $39, you know, uh, Amazon reel <laughs> wonder why they can't skip it, it, it's some of it's not them it's it's the equipment they have yeah it's so much about that is like with bait casters you do get what you pay for and now especially when I was younger that was the case luckily technology and pricing has come down to where the mid budget's not bad you don't have to just buy the the upper high end of everything yes which again, cause like fishing, it's so easy to get nickel and dimed with every single thing. It's kind of nice that the costs are slowly coming down, but yeah, don't go to Walmart. You can get some good reels at a good budgeted price. That'll make the experience very enjoyable. Yes. Yes. Um, and you know, not to be a commercial or whatever, but go, I mean, if you're new or whatever, I, I was in Jake's just the other day, got me a new shirt. That's <laughs> a shout out to them. But go somewhere like that, that that knows and they'll help you get set up, you know, and, and they're they're not there just to sell you the most expensive thing in the case. They'll be honest with you and get you set up. It's a mistake I see a lot with these young young kids and stuff that it's it's like skis or golf clubs. The equipment's gotta fit, you know, and you see this kid that it's it's what three foot six inches tall and he's got a seven foot extra heavy rod trying to skip mm -hmm. with and and yeah that that doesn't work and it's amazing you know when when i take kids it, it's like a bag of golf clubs almost i got all different sizes and stuff and i can almost look at that kid and i'm like okay i need like a six six for this kid he's a little short and you know a little guy and, and it's amazing how his accuracy will pick up and stuff when it helps and fits him a little better on that um i like a 3000 series reel but when you got a you know a 10 year old kid that doesn't fit him real well his hands that that's that's huge to him and that took me a little while to wrap that what fits me doesn't fit him yeah, yeah. So maybe i got to drop down to almost like a trout fishing 1000 size series reel on there and it works better for them so um but yeah definitely equipment i mean they're, the equipment makers are out there to sell it to you and I, the adult male that fishes, the 90% the, the demographic that fishes and not these kids, you know. So um, to the mom and dads out there, you know, it helps to maybe take a minute, go to a pro shop and, and get some stuff that fits your kid and helps them. 100% agree with that, dude. I really do. I, J Jason, I, I mean, I really appreciate you coming on today. Um, do yep. you have anything coming up or anything that we can promote? Um, not a whole lot. Uh, I've been taking some guys on D Creek. If anybody would like to learn, I've been helping a lot with the kids. I've had some time freed up. If anybody would like to take a trip on D Creek, learn how to skip docks or whatever, I'd love to teach you. Um, give me, give me a shout out there. Um, still dragging my feet starting my uh youtube channel <laughs> on there um work schedules um, we've had a blessed year with my company so i've been super super busy that's why i'm in a hotel room now doing this with you but uh yeah hopefully how, i get that how long, how long do you get back to a normal life is this going to be like the norm for a while the hotel life yes um yeah more and more yeah um with the company i work for we travel a lot and i kind of like it just like here it give me the opportunity i get down here it's kind of cool to find new water, find new people. Um, found Sarge's bait and tackle down the road here, made friends with them. I, I kind of like that. Um, I miss the wife. She travels with me a lot. But, oh, nice. uh, yeah, we're empty nesters now. So, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, this is going to be life for a while. And then when I'm home, you know, I rush home by the grass, and the next morning we'll deep creek. But, yeah, our life has changed a lot, but I appreciate you having me on and hopefully maybe I'll get to join you on the advisory committee and <laughs> on there and 
uh, that's what I got coming up in the near future. But well, dude, and then yeah, absolutely, and and hopefully you make it onto the board. And dude, you've had such a stellar career already. Over four thousand bass caught, documented over such a short period of time over a hundred citations with most of them coming out of deep creek lake so many kids that you've helped send us championships jason you've had a hell of a career and you're still going i cannot wait to have you on the show again to see what other titles you've broken and records that have been busted and all this other stuff that you have coming up yeah i kind of think i'm getting to the out of things to chase after but yeah like i said it was literally like two weeks ago i hit 100 so then I'm like, oh, what, what, that? you know, and everybody's like, what are you going to do that? I, I don't know. I'm just, just enjoying it. But it, it's crazy when you're chasing after something like that. And then you get there, there's like the, this feeling of what's next, you know? Mm-hmm. And like we said, I'm not a tournament fisherman or anything on it. So yeah, I'd like to get kind of creative and um, see what pops up and what crazy uh, goal I can come up with next, maybe on there um but i'll keep you up to date and let you know what crazy idea i dream up and chase after next time so and um, definitely you'll be back uh when that time comes to see what other crazy things you've been up to as always guys link in the episode description to everything that we talked about today if you'd like to please leave us a review on on apple podcast it really helps us push the podcast out to more and more people if you'd like to come support us on patreon our goal is to start a nonprofit to help supplementally stock our local waterways in virginia and maryland and to help uh polish up some of our boat ramps that are in really bad decay like and subscribe to the channel and we'll see you next time on fishing the dmv bye you're listening to fishing the dmv with your host thomas aarons Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.